Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is from Matthew chapter 2, following a star. Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to be, and we're going to be first 13 verses in there eventually, uh, looking at the wise, the wise guys here. Uh, the problem with our manger scene is these wise guys, the, the wise men. Uh, any men here like to shop? Like it's your favorite thing? Anybody, any men here hate to shop like your legs fall off after about 10 minutes? Like I can hunt all day. I can fish all day. I walk, I walk one aisle of the mall, you know, not even make a left. You know, he goes and makes a jag and then makes it one, one, one aisle, one, one run. I'm done. Just like, I got to sit down, honey. I'll just wait for you right here. I've got my phone. You can call me. <laughs> here, guys, I've got, I've got some defense, some, some, some scientific defense for us, some, some clinical defense for us. British psychologist David Lewis reports that shopping is hazardous to men's health. I'll send you, I'll Get, send me your email. I'll send, it, send this article to you. He uh, tested volunteers ages 22 through 79 years old, sending them out on Christmas shopping, and interestingly enough, recorded blood pressures uh, of, among the men that would rate, he said, right up there with a, combat, a pilot going into combat. Uh, men just can't handle it. Uh, I have a hard time at HEB, at Walmart. Um, they don't put things in order where I would think they would be. And then the, the stuff I'm looking for, they, they need bigger signs, you know. You got like four, four things on those signs. The thing I'm looking for is never on one of those signs. Whatever down this aisle is not going to be on that sign, you can be sure. And I have no idea where it was, even though I found it last week. I will not be able to find it this week. Well, it's interesting that they recorded that men shouldn't be doing this. Uh, clinically, they also did the same study with the same group of same ages and groups and grouping of women with no change in blood pressure whatsoever. So, there you have some science for you. There uh, reminds me of a story of two men who decided to go sailing instead of Christmas shopping with their wives. Smart move. Well, they get out there though, and they got in a huge storm, and I mean like a really bad storm, like in fear of their lives type of storm, and and battering them pretty bad, real difficulty controlling a, a boat that's controlled by the wind, and uh, ran aground on an unseen sandbar. And I don't know if any of you sail, but if you run aground, uh, you, the boat doesn't have a reverse. And so they had to get out of the boat, both of them, in order to push it off the sandboard bar. And of course, they're up to about their chest in water, and the waves are breaking over their head, and the wind's blowing, and it's so loud they can hardly hear each other. And they're pushing and shoving, and one turns to the other with a big smile on his face, though. He says, but it sure beats the heck out of shopping, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. Which, by the way, brings up a long-pondered question of who actually bought the gifts for Jesus. Was it these guys? Or was it their wives? I think we know. I think we know. I think if they were wise, they probably had really good wives, right? And they listened to their wives as to what they should bring. And then thus we have the story, which of course uh, is uh, in, in the scriptures. So why were these guys really wise? Well, we don't want us to look at those. And there's several things that we're going to mark together uh, to consider them as wise this morning. We're, like I said, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to be in verses 1 through, let's just go through 1, one through 3 to begin with. So it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrive in Jerusalem. So notice it says, after Jesus was born. Of course, the star doesn't show up until when? Until that night. And so these guys are upwards to a thousand miles away, and there are no airplanes, there are no trains, there are no buses, there are no cars. And uh, there's no f fast track of any kind. And so you're looking at a year and a half, maybe even two years until these guys get there. Uh, and, and also, we know that it took this long because Herod is, as we're, if you know, if you, in case you don't know, we're not going to read it. But, but uh, Herod attempts to assassinate Jesus, right? He has every baby in Bethlehem killed below the age of what? You remember? Based upon the date that the... The Magi, the wise men, had seen the star. So he figured Jesus had to be about two years old by the time these guys showed up. That's how long they've been on the road, okay? So having them, you've got to have them in the manger scene where else they're going to go. I mean, you've got to have more than that. Maybe a couple more shepherds could. You could argue the shepherds, of course, being there, and maybe some animals, but I'm thinking not the wise men. So they show up in Jerusalem, it says. And, I, and, and in addition... Um, uh, it never says there's three of them. It never says there's one of them. It never says there's. It just says plural magi. That's that's a plural word. 
So we know there's more than one, but there could have only been two. There might have been 10, and there might have been 100. But I would suggest to you whether it was 10 or 100, they wouldn't have been traveling by themselves. Here's one of the things you need to keep in your mind. Uh, Rome ruled Palestine at this time, right? Because it was the Roman soldiers that, that crucified Jesus ultimately. Uh, Rome, uh, Israel was under the boot heel of, of Rome, had been for quite a while, continued to be pretty much from then on. Uh, the Magi come from a warring territory that is, in, that is actually at, at the time of Christ's birth at war with the Romans, which is, wasn't a smart thing to do. The Parthians, they were the ruling class, or they were part of the ruling class of the Parthians. So, so you're the president, or you're a leader of a foreign country that's at war with the United States, and you're going to travel to the United States? We're at war in the Second World War with Germany, but we're going to send one of our ambassadors over to, I guess, to talk to Hitler or something like that? I don't think so. We're shooting each other in the fields. Why would... I'm not volunteering for that job. I don't know about you. I don't care what you pay me. These guys voluntarily get up, leave their country, go into a, an enemy territory, uh, probably with an entourage of several thousand with them, wives, children goats, chickens, ducks, everything with them because they had to eat on the way. And they come into Jerusalem, which explains better what's going to happen here. It says, when they come into Jerusalem, where is he who was born king of the Jews is a question. For we have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And notice what the reaction was. First of all, the king of Jerusalem, Herod. And then it says, the whole city were troubled at them. Why? It wasn't three guys. It wasn't ten. It was a huge entourage. From, from your enemy territory. And so talk about uh, the talk of the town. Uh, they would definitely be the talk of the town. So let's, let's stop right there and consider a few things here. And let me just say this for the record, set the record straight in defense of these men. Ladies, they had been traveling for a year and a half before they pulled over and asked for directions. <laughs> That's okay, guys. After a year and a half... In, in the rule of pigheadedness, the section two, it says that after a year and a half, you can pull over. You can still keep your man card and everything after a year and a half. But, but we don't have to pull over because it's not in the Bible, right? It's not in the Bible, so we don't have to do it. And these guys didn't pull over. And like I said, I'm pretty sure they had their wives with them. They pull over in Jerusalem and uh, to ask for directions. And of course, Herod and everybody stirred up about it. And they gather, he gathers together the, the, the scribes and the, the Pharisees in order to find out the answer. But the, the strange thing about them is, and, and again, ladies, in defense of these men, they're not wise because they pulled over and asked for directions. They're wise. They're wise because of what got them there up to that point. What got them there? You remember? Only a star. So you can imagine, these are ruling class. These are guys that have a job. They have a full-time job. They serve a king. They probably have people over them. They have people under them. Uh, and so they're going to take off for an undetermined amount of time, which turns out if it took them a year and a half to get there. Probably took them about a year and a half to get back. So you're going to get three years at the minimum that you're off the clock. And uh, what's your reason for leaving? We see a star. Okay, I'm sure everybody could see it. But they interpret it very differently than anyone else. These guys are the only ones that show up. They're the only ones that go, as far as we know, after the manger scene with Mary and Joseph and some uh, angel-inspired shepherds, nobody else visits Jesus. Only these guys. They start trekking the night of. They're there about a year and a half to two years later. No one else travels with them. No one else goes. In fact, even though the information that they spread here is, is out there, no one else listens to them. Why were these guys wise? Because if nothing with nothing but a star... They take this trek. With nothing but a star, they follow God. They were right. How many of you would have believed them? Where, there's there's a, 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 a weird little verse in the Old Testament. of the, here's, here's, your, here's your excuse if you're them. There's a weird little verse in the Old Testament which we believe points to a Messiah, the king of the Jews, and now there's a special star out there. Who knows what it was, a comet or whatever. And we believe that this star is it. So we're taking off work for the next three some odd years and uh, see you later. And uh, I could hear them talking their wives into all this as well. Um, and here we go, right? This huge entourage off in enemy territory based upon nothing more than that amount of information. Now, everybody else, do you think everybody, everybody just sat by and watched them march out of the city and think, those are such wise people. <laughs> if they had, 
they had gone with them. When they arrived in Jerusalem, as we're going to see in just a second, they asked for directions concerning the Messiah and point to the star, which, by the way, everyone else could see. No one else even goes from Jerusalem. You know how far Jerusalem is from Bethlehem? Five miles as the crow flies. I mean, I think we can risk five miles to take a chance that maybe a star points to something. No one goes with them. Everybody thinks they're foolish, but they were not, were they? They were wise. So here's a question for you. Following a star, they put up with all that stuff. What does it take for you to follow God? Or maybe I should say, what will it take for you to follow him? Because God is speaking. He is. And the question is, are you listening well enough? Consider, continuing, continuing in verse 4. And he, that is Herod, gathered together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people and began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. That's a Greek word for the word Messiah. The Jewish word title for their kings was Messiah. They named all their kings Messiah, and Christ is, a, is, a, is the Greek interpretation. It's not a name, it's a title. And he said to him, in Bethlehem, notice these guys don't even crack a Bible. They know it from memory. They know where the Messiah is going to be born. From memory, they say, in Bethlehem, Judea. then they quote the verse out of Micah, and and you, O Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who shall we will shepherd my people. So wow. Finally, I'm thinking they've traveled these thousand miles or whatever, and they finally come across some people who know the Bible. Finally, uh, these guys knew the Bible pretty well, apparently, to know that there was going to be a star and that that star would refer to a king of the, the ultimate king of Israel. And so we finally get to Jerusalem. Finally, we've got some Bible believers here, right? This is going to be great. And so they talk about the star, apparently, and what do the scribes and Pharisees do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They can quote to you the Bible, but they can't follow the Bible. That's very instructive about a bunch of us religious people here. So you know the Bible, awesome. What are you doing about it? Show me how your life is different, or I should say, show God how your life is different. Don't say, oh, well, I know the Bible, and God must be so impressed with me. I would suggest to you very strongly, no, he's not. That is if you're not doing it. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time of the star. Now, here's where he's starting his plot. Of course, he's, he's plotting assassination, right? And he sent them to Bethlehem with a lie of, go and make careful search for the child, he says. And when you found him, report it to me that I too may come and worship him. Of course, Herod had already killed two of his wives and one of his sons at this point, whom he thought paranoid, very paranoid, schizophrenic kind of guy. He thought they may threaten him in his throne, and so he had them killed. And so you think he's going to bother or care any, anything about killing a bunch of kids in Bethlehem? Of course not. That was what he did. Of course, these magi are none the wiser, but they're going to be warned by God in a dream in just a bit. We'll see that. He sent them to Bethlehem with that. And so verse 9, having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the, there was a star which had been they'd seen in the east and went before them until it came and stood over where the child was. So by the way, Bethlehem's, when it's, you sang the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, that's exactly right. There, there's more people in this room than probably in the whole city of Bethlehem, or I should say town of Bethlehem at the time these guys go. So I would suggest to you that the star, you know, did it stand over Bethlehem? Yes. But would, did they have, so it stood right directly over the house? You know, that's the picture, right? And I would say, yeah, maybe. But I would also say, you only got about 30 houses to search anyhow. And so find one that's got somebody that's got a child that claims to be the king of Israel, and then boom, you've got your place. So that's either way uh, they found him. Verse 10, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary and his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Now, this is amazing. So do you think, what do you think their house was like, by the way? So they've been there for a year, year and a half, two years. Uh, Joseph is a carpenter, right? He's had to hang out a shingle because they haven't left and gone back to Nazareth because they've stayed there in Bethlehem. So he started up his work there in Bethlehem. You think he's just made like millions of bucks while he's there and built a palace for Jesus because Jesus is a king. And so when these guys showed up, they immediately said, we're looking for the palace in Bethlehem. How did they find him? Like I said, there's probably only 30 houses in the place and he's probably in the most rundown of them all. And that's where they find this humble little couple and this single little baby about a year and a half Old, not at all what they would expect, I would suggest to you, what he would look like. But nonetheless, they fall down and worship him, it says, and they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned by God, here it is, don't go back to Herod, in the dream not to return to Herod, they departed 
And they went back to their country, their own country, another way. So several things for us to consider here uh, and think about. There were, first of all, three types of people that were introduced here in, in uh, three types of responses, I should say. First of all, you have the response of the wise men who need nothing more than a celestial disturbance to follow God. Praise God for a person like that. Praise God for a person who's available. Can God speak through a star? Well, you know it now, don't you? Would you have known it then? Would you, have been, would you have been much better than the rabble out there who simply knew everything? They had the same information that the Magi had, and yet stayed in their houses? Thought they were foolish? I said, we sit back today with all the information and say, oh, well, I can't believe these people were so hard-headed. Well, be careful. Then the second group of people, like the chief, chief priests and the scribes, who not only did they have a star, everybody could see it, they also had the Bible, which had the information about the star and the information about where the Messiah would be born, and they only lived five miles as the crow flies from the town. They could have made a jaunt down there just to check it out. Did they do it? No, they do not. No, they do not. And the final group, of course, is Herod, who, using all the signs, plots Jesus' assassination. Similarly, we have three types of people today. Number one, the people who, at the slightest sign of God, I pray this is true for you and for me, will follow him to the ends of the earth. At the slightest sign that you know it's God, you know it's him, you will take off. And not to say that you won't ask questions, but you're asking questions while you're packing your bags and you're moving out, those are the people that God uses. Those are the people that we sit back in awe of. And that's the kind of people that we need to be. The slightest sign they were willing to follow him. And then you have the others who all the signs in the world are never stir them off a dead center, right? Uh, there's a lot of people who like it's a, one, one thing less than getting hit over the head. They're still not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're still not honoring God with their lives. And then you have the ones who, I, in my opinion, believe the Bible the most. Because they're the ones who are trying to run the hardest the other way. Uh, you talk about Herod who believed. Did Herod believe that Jesus was the king of the Jews? He slaughtered a whole town full of babies. He believed it so much. It's amazing to me that the quote-unquote atheists out there who don't believe in God, who, who fight so hard, I mean, if he isn't real, what's the big deal with you? That's my question I have for those people. Why are you so up in arms? Why do you got to be so vocal and so uh, antagonistic? I mean, if God doesn't exist, just let it go. It's like, well, these people are crazy. I'm just going to let it go. No, they can't do that. They're like Herod. So God always speaks loud enough, listen, for the willing ear to hear. A star or, or uh, clear instructions from the word, there's plenty of evidence, but there's never enough evidence for an unwilling ear. There's not. There's just not. I've, I've had plenty, plenty of conversations with people who are simply trying to get past the whole issue of explain to me how God exists. Well, I can't fully explain that to you. The Bible doesn't ever attempt to explain the existence of God, not even once. It just assumes that we know. Oh, well, i got to have empirical evidence. Okay, well, see you later. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't get you past faith. God won't let me get past faith. He won't let you get past faith. You're going to have, he's going to reach a point where you're just going to have to believe him. Or not. Or not. But, so the question is, do we have a willing ear? So I want to num number off six things for us this morning, and we're going to be done Things that we can learn from the wisdom of the wise men. Six things about their following God and following the star that demonstrate to us in every way that they certainly were wise men. And what can we learn from their, um, from their decisions? The first thing that we can learn is that when God gives you a sign, you need to follow him. When God gives you a sign, you need to follow him. Don't wait till you got it all figured out. What do these guys know about what they were doing? Do they know Jesus' name? No. Do they know where he lived? Do they know what his parents look like? Do they, they know he's in Israel somewhere. They have no idea other than there's a star. We know there's a star. And we're going to follow that because God, we believe, is speaking through, as a result of this star or through, through this star. And so they don't wait. Like I said, not, they have questions. They're having to talk to their wives and their kids and their entourage. What is it going to be like? We don't really know. We'll, we'll tell you when we figure it out. Nonetheless, what are they doing? 
packing their bags, moving out. Don't wait. Listen, when God gives you a sign, follow him. Follow him. Number two, expect him when God speaks to speak and lead you at any time. When did these guys see the star? Or I should say, under what circumstances? Were they at church? Were they at worship service? We don't see anything like that. What do these guys do for a living? They studied the stars. This is their job. So that, it, stars were significant to them. And so when something happens in the celestial realms, by the way, when a person who's an expert in the field comes to you, comes to you with information from his expertise and says, you'd be wise to listen to that person, whatever that circumstance is, because that is what they do. So when guys who study the stars come to you and say, let me tell you something, stars, the star thing is happening, we need to get going, people should have listened. Of course, they, they did not. But uh, So these guys didn't wait around for people to listen to them. They got moving. Expect that God can lead you at any time. And these guys, where were they led from? On their job. They were doing what they had done every single day, and then lo and behold, boom, in the process of doing what they always did, God spoke. God moved. Same is true, not only in the, the case of the Magi, but it's true all the way through scriptures. In most of the situations in the scriptures, when God speaks to men and women, he speaks to them outside of church. In fact, there isn't a church until there's not a single church in the Old Testament because the church didn't exist. There's not a church in the four gospels because the church didn't exist. Jesus had not died and resurrected. Not until the book of Acts is God speaking in the context of the church. And very rarely does he, do you ever see an example in which they were at a church and God spoke to them. There's some examples. There's not a lot of them. In most cases, God's speaking to them in the marketplace. God's speaking to them in dreams. God's speaking to them as they're going about their daily lives. God is speaking and leading to them. Expect that God will continue to act the way that he has written himself down to act. As he acted that way in the scriptures, expect the same thing in your life. Again, examples are a plethora in the scriptures. Moses, what was he doing when God spoke to him in the burning bush? Same thing he'd been doing for 40 years, shepherding the flock of his father Jethro. It was his job. Day to day, day out, day in, day out, that's what he did, and that's where God spoke to him. Gideon was threshing grain. Why? That's what he did. Where did God speak to him? While he was doing the stuff that he did every single day. Day. It's so important that we get this. Peter and Andrew, James and John, what they do for a living? They fish. Where did Jesus call them? When they got out of the boat. That's where they were. They weren't in church. They weren't in a synagogue. If we're only waiting for worship services and special occasions for God to speak, I would suggest, I mean, how many, how many of you spend 24-7 in churches? Besides myself and Pastor Greg. I live here, by the way. Welcome to the place where I live. <laughs> Hope you like everything. Please leave everything out like you found it. Nobody else lives here, do you? Or where is God going to meet you? Where you live. What you do. Where you do it. Same was true for these guys. The same is true for you. The same place you found Peter, James, and John. I mean, Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and Peter's uh, brother, Andrew. Matthew, what was Matthew doing? extorting people in a tax booth yeah even in a sinful circumstances even in a sinful circumstances doing the stuff god called him out of that right spoke to him right where he was expecting god to, oh well that guy's going to come into church and god's going to change his life i'm not saying that doesn't happen i'm just saying it's not normal normal is out there normal is the six days out of the week that we're not in most of the time even on sunday that we're not even in church that's normal life that's where god is normally we should expect him to speak in our normal comings and goings. So expect him to speak and lead at any time. Number three, expect God to lead you through practically anything. So if he can speak through a star, guess what? You should keep the door wide open. God is not limited to anything through which he can speak to you. Practically anything. A book. Here's some things that God has spoken to me in my own personal life. A book, a conversation, a song, a sermon, a television show, not even about God, a, a chance comment that I heard from somebody. These are just my own personal experiences. God is not limited to anything. He can use anything in your life. Make sure you're listening. 
I said, we kind of turn God off when church is over and we turn him back on 15 minutes before we get to church. Listen, that's a mistake. You're missing him. You're missing him because God is the God of the common. God is the God of people. And where are people? Most of the time, they're not in church. Sometimes never. God is there with those people. God is always speaking. Expect him to lead through practically anything. Number four, find your way by consulting scripture. So they started out following a star, right? What did they do next? They got sidetracked in Jerusalem. They go to the word. Where does it say the Messiah is to be born? And they give them the exact five miles down, downwind from here. Five miles from here, the city of Bethlehem, it says in the book of Micah. They got their instructions for that. Let me just say this to you. If you find yourself lost, maybe you have lately, don't call your mother. I should say, call her. But consult God first. Consult the word first. Some of us prefer someone else to be in a relationship with God for us. We want everybody to do stuff for us, don't we? Let the pastor be in a relationship with God for us. It's not that, I mean, can you call the pastor and ask him how he feels about stuff? Sure, but I would suggest to you, ask God first. Go to the word first. Don't call your mom. Don't call your friend. Don't call your pastor. Go to the word. What is God saying to you? You're in a rela- hopefully in a personal relationship with him. He considers it personal to you. But you want to continue to consult God through other people? That's not what he died. That's not what he sent Jesus to die for. He wants you. Relationship with you. So give it to him and you're going to find out that God's going to speak and God's going to lead. And that's where we should be getting our directions from. So when when you get lost or any other circumstance, consult the word. And then a fifth thing. Don't let anything stop you. Talk about some obstacles these guys had to overcome. So you're going to leave... They're at war with Rome. Rome is not exactly friendly with people who are not friendly with her. So, so I'm, I'm of the ruling class. It's not that these guys can ride incognito. You're of a ruling class, and you're going to travel into an enemy territory to risk your necks over a star that you believe points to the Messiah. Okay, that doesn't sound too wise to me. Well, in fact, it was. They overcame all kinds of obstacles hundreds of miles by the way we don't know if they rode camels most people who were of any kind of prowess did not ride camel and i know that's going to mess up a lot of your greeting cards (laughs) but they probably didn't ride camels and if any of you have ridden a camel you will know why that anybody that had a choice to ride a horse or a mule or anything else would not ride a camel camels are terrible and the saddles they have are terrible. And in addition, camels are just nasty creatures anyhow. So these guys most likely did not. Now, probably their entourage had camels, but probably not these guys. They probably had really nice mounts, I would suggest to you. If I got money, and I'm not going to ride a camel, I can promise you. So, so they didn't let that obstacle stop them. They didn't let culture stop them. They didn't let language stop them. They didn't let religious barriers stop them. They're magi. It's where we get our word magic from. They're, they're uh, uh, soothsayers, if you will consulting the king uh talk about some religious barriers they were of course the hostile king here they didn't let that stop them and different religious leaders they didn't let anything stop them so here's the question what's stopping you what's holding you up on a star on a star these guys put up with this kind of stuff it's impressive it really is why don't we call them wise men well there you go and then a final thing this is an important thing. Maybe for me, the hardest thing in following God. Because I'm good with that other stuff. I just have a difficult, I have to constantly beat myself up over this. Because I have a trouble with this. Here's, here's another thing about following God. Always remember this. You're the, not the leader. You're the follower. You're not the leader. You're the follower. You say, of course, Pastor Bill. Everybody knows that, right? But nobody does it. Because here's what we do. As soon as we get a word from God, like, say we're all wise men here, we get a star in heaven, and uh, we immediately plan the whole trip out. Okay, here's how it's going to go. Of course, he's going to be in a palace. He's going to be awesome. We've got our, our gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We've got to make sure our, our best gowns on, our best stuff on, and then we're going to get there. It's going to be great. We're going to have a lot of food together. We're going to hang out. We're going to go and see some shows and do some stuff because he's the king, and then how did it all work out for him? Two little impoverished people, Joseph with a shingle hung outside in a town of about 
500 people. Uh, somebody had to take them back there in, a, in the back of a house, probably, I would imagine. They're just letting out a room in the back and saying, well, oh, this is where the couple you're looking for actually lives. Not at all what they thought. But I want to, again, point it out to you. didn't matter because they understood they're the followers, not the leaders. The leaders make the decisions of how it's going to go. The followers just take it, don't they? The followers just say, okay, not what I thought, but it's okay. It didn't happen on the day that I thought, but that's okay. I'm the follower. It didn't turn out the way I thought it would look or with the people I thought it would go with, but that's okay. Why? I'm the follower, you see. Got to be real careful to remind yourself you're the follower you're not the leader. You're surrendered to him. And so as he leads you, as it works out, is what? It is what it is, right? Whatever it is, it is what it is. And let it be that because God is the leader. Don't forget that. Be careful that you don't make your own plans and how it's all going to go. And then you make everything fit into this tight little box. And then when it doesn't go that way, you fall apart. Now, you notice how well I preach to myself on this. Because I'm real good at that. I've come out, it's hard to not design everything once you have, the, it's going to go this way and it's going to work out this way and it's going to have this kind of timer on it. And, and um, invariably, it's almost like God picks those things and says, okay, since you decided on those things, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't go that way for you. <laughs> Anybody like me? And don't forget, by the way, you're on your way following God and while you're looking for and following God's leadership that uh, he has placed us, hasn't he? as wise men, wise ladies, but also as stars, wherever we go. Because I, I already know the Savior. I hope you do. Maybe you don't today, and you're here following, if you will, the light, the truth, and needing to hear the truth that God's Son, Jesus Christ, has come. He didn't remain a baby. He became a man in order to die, to take your place and my place, to pay for my sins, so that everyone who believes him to them he gives the right to become the children of God. The scripture says he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. So if you're here following, if you will, that kind of star, listen, look no further. Jesus is the king. He is the savior. Someone, listen though, we've got to remind ourselves that we're stars in this universe, in a black universe. God has set us up that way. Someone who's a star in your life, probably a lot of people were stars, weren't they? Pointing you in the right direction. So don't forget to shine. You know, we look at this humble scene of this baby. I mean, why would God ever become this? Of all the things he could have chosen to be. I mean, send him as a full-grown man, all right? But make him humble, all right? But, 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 but a baby in a stable to an impoverished couple? I mean, you can't get more vulnerable than that. You can't get more, more uh, weak than that, can you? And yet at the same time, we see the hand of God. God, even though he moves in weakness, he still, he still moves in power, doesn't he? So a, as Jesus is born, his, his birth affects the heavens. Because the guys about a thousand miles away say, hey, something's different. Pack your bags. Something's happening. We're going. We're leaving, right? So even though a little baby in the middle of nowhere is born, something, it's not, it's not a regular baby, is it? So the star, uh, heavens were affected by his birth, and then the, the, the star affects the magi, and then the magi show up, and they affect King Herod and the whole city of Jerusalem, don't they? And then at the same time, when, when Jesus is born, back, back a year before, uh, angels are, of course, brought down from heaven, and they turn midnight into midday for the sake of a few shepherd, shepherds, don't they? Because the power of God, even in humility, the power of God is unavoidable. It's unmistakable. The power of God works. It is. And the, the movement of God and the voice of God and the leadership of God is available to everyone with an, with an eye willing to see it and an ear willing to hear it. I'm going to ask you please to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we talk just a second more here with your heads bowed and your eyes closed about the things that God has said to us this morning. And again, are you here because you want to know the truth? Well, listen, the truth is Jesus is the king. Not just of the Jews. He's it. Jesus is everything. He's our life. Scripture says, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man or woman comes to the Father except through me. 
you're trying to get to God, you want, you want your life to be made right with God, let me tell you something, there is a roadblock for you. And that roadblock is the one you've set up. Because you're deciding you're going to come your own way. It will never work. The God of heaven doesn't bend down to accept your rules and how it's going to go your way. No, God has already established his terms of peace. His terms of peace are in his son, Jesus Christ. God's son, Jesus Christ, is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And you will not come to the Father. You will not come to God except through him. You must accept the reality of who Jesus is, that he is the king. It's not a matter of whether he is the king or not. It's a matter of, is he your king? It's not a matter of whether he's the savior or not. Is he your savior? Have you accepted him? Have you, uh, have you in, as an act of your own personal will, had an encounter with the savior in which you've accepted him and allowed him to be the savior of your life? What a, not a better time on the calendar than the time that we celebrate his birth for you to surrender yourself to him and say, I want you to be my king. I want you to be my savior. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you, Lord Jesus, to make me right with God because only he can do it. Do you need to pray a prayer like that today? And for the rest of us who know him as king, are you following him as Lord? And we call him Lord, we call him king, but is that the way your life looks? Do you have an ear that's willing to listen, or are you one of those kind of people that's just hard to get off dead center? God is speaking, and he's being heard by those who are willing to listen. Maybe what you need to say to him this morning is, God, I want to be willing. God, I, I change my heart. T- change my stubbornness. Change my waywardness. Change what sin has done to me and, and clogged up my ears. Clear me out, God, and make me able to hear you again. Open my eyes to see what you're doing around me so I can be involved in it. Help me, forgive me for expecting you to just work on certain days and in certain places. Open my eyes everywhere, everywhere I am. God, I thank you that you are speaking, that you are leading. I thank you for these wise men who have demonstrated to us what it means to follow you, who risk so much, but who were rewarded so well because they did the right thing, disregarding what anyone said or what any circumstances may have pointed to. They followed you. God, I pray that we would be a room full of wise men and wise women. Thank you for speaking to us today. We trust you, God, and we thank you for working in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.